Hello my friends, HM here. I make videos about topics that are important for whether the future will be better or worse. Cobalt is an important ingredient for making better electric vehicles, but also portable devices like phones and laptops. This video investigates the current and unfortunately serious supply chain risks for cobalt. It also proposes three different strategies that can effectively address these supply chain risks for cobalt. Before we begin, you should know that HM Experience aspires to be as true as possible. For that reason, all claims made are documented by clickable links to other internet resources. This documentation can be downloaded by following the link below this video to my vlog at hmexperience.dk. Okay, so let's get started with this PowerPoint presentation here. So it's called Solutions to Cobalt Supply Chain Problems for transitioning to a better electric vehicle only future. And the first thing we will note here is that the cost of cobalt in a typical battery electric vehicle isn't that much. Cobalt currently costs 34 US dollar per kilo, but we only use 6.2 kilo of it to make a typical battery electric vehicle. And here I've used Tesla's Model Y long range with a 83 kilowatt hour battery for my example. And I basically made this table over here where I've listed all the raw material elements that are going into making such a battery electric vehicle. And it uses graphite, nickel, lithium, carbonate, copper, manganese, magnesium, zinc, cobalt, rare earth, aluminium, crude steel, and plastic textiles and other. It all sums up to 1,630 kilo. And as we can see here in this table, only 6.2 kilo are cobalt. Multiply that with 34 US dollar per kilo, we get 211 US dollar, which is not much of the total US dollars needed for buying raw materials to make one battery electric vehicle. So that is 6,200 almost US dollars. But cobalt price is quite volatile. Sometimes a cobalt price goes up three times, and then it will of course be 600 US dollars that Tesla would, would have to pay for getting their cobalt for their batteries. And we can see here how volatile the price is. I have a graph here showing the price. It's measured in US dollar per ton. So we can see sometimes it pops up the past 15 years or so. And here in 2017, it looks like it popped up over 90,000 US dollar for one ton of cobalt. And again, here in 2022, it popped up to almost $90,000. And now it's at those $34,000. But also it should be noted that Tesla is using a battery chemistry that doesn't use as much cobalt as other typical battery chemistries that are used for battery electric vehicles. They've been trying to cut down on cobalt because it is quite expensive per kilo. So other battery electric vehicle makers, they might have twice as high cost, so $400. And then if the price pops up 3x, well, then they are paying $1,200 US for cobalt. And that's quite serious. That's because it's a large part of this $6,200 US for raw material cost in a battery electric vehicle. Also, where is cobalt used today in the global supply chains? Well, it's already used mostly for making batteries. So batteries is over 56% of all use cases for cobalt. We can see it down here in this uh, table that summarizes uh, where cobalt is used globally in 2020. So batteries is 56%, then nickel-based alloys would be 13%, and tool materials 8%, pigments 6%, and catalyst magnets, soap and dryers, etc is the remaining. And if we are looking into the future, we should definitely expect cobalt to be used even more for batteries and less percentage-wise or relatively speaking for everything else. Because demand for battery electric vehicles and also for grid storage is going up. It rises between 30 and 40 percent each year. So we will see cobalt used even more in the future. I would say it very likely go above 90 percent of all use will go into battery production in the future. And the reason is that cobalt is a very good material for making uh, battery cathodes. That's a plus electrode in lithium ion uh, batteries. And why is it a good uh, material? Because when you add cobalt to that cathode, you can make batteries with high energy density that obviously are wanted. But you can also make batteries that have high thermal stability. 
and thus a long battery life and that's obviously also something that you'd like to have in your batteries but i think that's enough for this table here so let's move on unfortunately there are very high supply chain risk for cobalt in battery electric vehicles and it's not difficult to see that because i made this table here with cobalt mine production and reserves in tons in 2022 and it shows that we produced 190,000 tons of cobalt in that year. But most of that production, in fact, 76% of that came from countries that are high risk. In particular, one country, DR Congo, made 68% of all cobalt in the world. And why is that a risky country? It's because it's a very poor country and they have a history of civil war and instability. So you can't really depend on that country for delivering cobalt. Currently, there are no civil war in the country, but it's still very poor and unstable politically. So so a civil war could break out any moment and stop this supply. And then there are also all the countries I've highlighted with pink are the countries I consider risky. Russia, obviously risky. And Cuba, risky. And China, risky. Uh, so I add this up and it's 76% of global production. That's a lot. And also if we look at the reserves for cobalt, it's not as bad there, but it's still 58% uh, of all the, re the global reserves that are held by countries that are risky. So that's not a very good situation. And the thing here is that all these countries' supply could disappear if there's some kind of political problem or civil war. And it's getting worse because if we look forward, we know we need to make about 100 million battery electric vehicles every year in order to go fully battery electric for our transportation industry. And if we make that many vehicles, well, then I have this table over here where I have calculated how much material would we need for making that many battery electric vehicles. And it's basically the table as we had before, where I have one average battery electric vehicle represented by the Tesla Model Y and all the materials listed in kilo. Then I multiply that with 100 million in order to get how much material we'll need for making 100 millions of these vehicles. And you can see we need actually 618,000 tons of cobalt if they all use the same cobalt content as this Tesla Model Y currently do. And as we are mining 190,000 tons of cobalt, well, that would be 325% of current global production that would be needed for making all these battery electric vehicles. So that's probably not going to happen. Also because we will, as I will come back to in a later slide, we'll see that there are battery chemistries that doesn't use any cobalt, so we don't really need to put cobalt in all of our battery electric vehicles but still if we had the cobalt we would probably use it and as we can see down here with global cobalt production it has actually almost doubled from 2012 it was 103,000 tons of cobalt per year and then it has grown to 190,000 10 years later so maybe a doubling is possible but well, that would give us about 400,000 tons and also I made a little calculation here. Uh, what if we use all the known reserves of cobalt to make battery electric vehicles with, a, with this chemistry that Tesla uses in their battery? Well, we could make 1.35 billion battery electric vehicles if we did that. And basically I have here the reserves of cobalt. That's 8.3 million tons of cobalt. And I divide that with 6.2 kilos that are used in each vehicle. And that would give you 1.35 billion vehicles. But then again, we saw that only a quarter of this cobalt is coming from countries that are friendly, where we know we can get the cobalt from. So we can divide this with four, and then we'd only be able to make about 350 million vehicles that has a cobalt-rich battery. I wouldn't say the supplies or the reserves of cobalt are very uh, high, but then again, there are other ways to get more cobalt out of this world, and I'll show you that. Okay, so what options do we have for dealing with cobalt supply chain risks? I found three options or strategies for dealing with supply chain problems for cobalt. And the first one is, of course, not to use battery chemistries that require any cobalt or, or just a lot of cobalt. And Tesla here is, again, my example. They had a presentation back in 2020 where they explained what they were doing. And they are switching a lot of their production of batteries to lithium ferron phosphate batteries, that's iron-based batteries. 
that using that for storage applications and also for mid-range cars and cars that are just smaller so they don't need a very high energy density because this LFP battery it is about 160 watt hours per kilo but it doesn't contain any cobalt and then for vehicles that require a little more energy density they use nickel manganese batteries that also has a little bit of cobalt in it but if it's only a little bit then they'll manage and then uh, they have developed also a high nickel battery that they are not in production with yet at Tesla, but they have developed it that doesn't use any cobalt at all, and that is actually quite high energy dense. And they will use that for applications here where they need the higher energy density. So that's one uh, strategy. And there's also a another battery chemistry that might get some success and that also doesn't use any cobalt and that's called natrium ion uh, batteries and again they have the drawback that they have fairly low energy density at about 160 watt hours per kilo but they might be used as well for, especially for storage and they have another advantage they don't use any nickel nor do they use any copper so but they are not in mass production yet no one are mass producing that battery i think i'll make a video in the future with this specific kind of battery where i'll talk about the possibilities and options for it and what's up and down with it uh it's promising that much i can say and the second strategy is to continue making battery cells with cobalt but acquire an emergency stock of cobalt to deal with sudden supply cut so if you have a strategy where you do make some of your cells that you use, make them with cobalt and then basically have a, in stock, let's say enough cobalt for continuing that production for two or three years, should your supply of cobalt be cut or the price should go astronomically high, then you have this stock of cobalt and then you can always make the switch, use the time, two or three years should be enough time to switch to plan B, which would be to use chemistries that doesn't have any cobalt in it so that your production of battery electric vehicles or whatever it is you use your battery for is not interrupted from this supply chain disruption. So a third uh, strategy is simply to wait for miners from risk-free countries to start mining cobalt and other elements from deep sea polymetallic noodles. And I have a little video to uh, show what that, that's about, and I think I'll play it, but I will play it without any sound here, so I'll just mute it, and then let's play it. So you can see here, there's a ship on the surface, uh, on a deep ocean, and it uh, loads down a, a thing here, uh, and a, a thing with caterpillars on uh, that can mine these noodles. And deep sea is really deep sea. Here we are at 4,000 meters uh, below the surface. So that's really deep down. down. This equipment doesn't exist today. It has to be developed uh, and it will cost billions of dollars to develop this ship. But the principle for how it should be done is thought out. And it, it will be done like this. So you can see it's, it's moving along the sea floor and all these things here, black things you can see on the... Uh, bottom of the ocean that's what's being mined and then they're being pumped up in this tube here first a uh, flexible tube and it connects to a non-flexible tube that's just a steel pipe where all this stuff here is uh, being pumped up uh, these noodles uh, into this uh, ship above ground and here uh, in this ship uh, it's kind of sorted with uh, with all the dust and sand that comes also is pumped up. That's pumped down again uh, in order not to make a big plume of sand that could affect life uh, further up the surface. I can say here, if you are below 1000 meter in the ocean, then there's no sunlight that goes down. It's completely dark. So if you can pump that stuff down below 1000 meters, then it's not going to affect a lot of life because there's almost none life down there. There is some life down there, but it's just far less than there is on the surface. And um, that's also why I don't think there will be any environmental problems with this stuff here. There will of course always be some people who, who talk about environmental problems, but 
There will be more environmental problems mining stuff on the surface than doing it in the deep sea on the bottom of the oceans, for sure. I think it's academic to talk about environmental problems with this. Uh, and we need to mine stuff to transition to a fossil fee economy. So it's just nonsense to come up with all these environmental excuses when it's about getting rid of the biggest environmental problem, which is really burning fossil fuels. So that's my take on that. But anyway, the big problem with this third strategy is that it will require at least 10 years to develop this machinery that's highly specialized, but it should definitely be done. But let's see what the potential is for this deep sea mining. I found a really good source for deep sea mining on the internet and it had some tables and figures that I've replicated here. But it is a source from 2014. I couldn't find anything that was newer, but it's really good. It has everything I really wanted to know about this. So what it shows is that Cobalt reserves in cobalt crusts plus manganese noodles are estimated to be 94 million tons or what will compare to 11.3 times as much cobalt as we know exists on land-based reserves in 2022. And we can see it here in this table over here where we have cobalt. So here global reserves on land economically mined today is 7.5 million tons, but that source is from 2014. So we know here in 2022, it, it had increased to 8.3 million tons. But uh, they had also estimated that cobalt crusts in prime crust zones are 50 million tons of cobalt. And then in manganese noodles, there is an additional 44 million tons of cobalt. So that's 94 million tons or 11.3 times more today's reserves of cobalt. So that would really solve all our needs for cobalt if we start mining stuff here from the ocean bottom. And I calculated how many battery electric vehicles could we make using these reserves. Well, we could make 15 billion battery electric vehicles, so that should get it covered. Deep sea mining will basically end all supply chain problems for cobalt. And we wouldn't have to buy from countries that can't be certain to deliver cobalt on time. And then again, my environmental uh, worries here about deep sea mining are non-existing. There are a few things we should protect. There are some geothermal vents that are pumping up some heat from the inside of the earth. And that heat is actually sustaining ecosystems. And I don't think we should just bulldoze that and destroy the ecosystems and unique life that exists there. That would be cruel. Although no humans are ever going to see or enjoy the life down there. It's just that life that nobody sentient have any way to enjoy. Apart from when we put a submarine down there and, and make a television show about it. But still, I think we should preserve that. And also they're not located at the same places where these uh, noodles can be found with cobalt in it. So we don't have to bulldoze that. But of course, there might be some species that lives down there that we will bulldoze through their little ecosystem. What is living down there on the deep sea floor? Well, it's only species that are living off the energy of cadavers from dead fish that falls down to the bottom. And then they're eaten by these cadavers are eaten by the life that's down there. I wouldn't say that's very interesting life. Plus, we're not going to destroy all of that life because as you can see here, there's a little map here of it and all the orange spots are the places where these noodles are located. So it's only here we're going to scrape the seafloor for these noodles and basically to probably destroy all the life that's living among those noodles. Yeah, it will happen, but there's so much more ocean floor where where this life is also living. It might be a little cynic way to perceive it, but we have bigger problems on the surface and there are more lives to protect on the surface than there is on the bottom of the oceans. And that's why I think we shouldn't worry too much about it. And also it's not only cobalt that these noodles uh, contain, they also contain manganese, copper, titanium, rare earth metals, and nickel, vanadium, all kind of things that we can mine. So it will solve a lot of problems. But I think that's enough for this slide here. 
Okay, so how hard is it to scale cobalt production? Specifically, we could ask the question of how hard is it to make 618,000 tons of cobalt annually or enough for making uh, 100 million battery electric vehicles. It's very doable as we'll only need to mine the equivalent of 309 million tons of typical cobalt ore at 0.2% cobalt. 309 million tons only represents 8% of the iron ore that's mined in 2021. We can see that in this table over here where I basically have listed the scale of the global raw materials industry by size in tons and also in US dollar sales. And here we have cobalt that in battery cells are 2% of the battery cell and cobalt at all is 0.2%. And we can see that we are mining 190,000 tons here in 2022. And to mine that, we need 95 million tons of ore. That's how much it is when we mine ore at 0.2% cobalt content. And over here in this last column, we have the materials in tons for 100 million battery electric vehicles. And that's here calculated 618,000 tons. That's enough for 100 million battery electric vehicles. And we can see down here we have iron ore. Iron ore is of course used to make iron that is used to make crude steel which is 98% iron and uh, we actually mine almost 4 billion tons of iron ore in order to make almost 2 billion tons of crude steel. The bulk of the mining industry is mining iron ore and we also have one other big thing that would be copper. Although we only make 21 million tons of copper, we're actually mining 3.5 billion tons of ore because copper ore is only 0.6% copper content. So that was a little sidestep, but I th thought I'd mention it to get the proportions uh, right in this uh, mining industry. So basically, can we do this? Can we mine 618,000 tons of cobalt? Definitely because it's only a tiny part, it's less than 10% of the global iron ore mining industry today. Also, if we look at it here, cobalt is a tiny mining industry. It's only worth 6.5 billion US dollars. And I've done it here. I've basically set these 190,000 tons of cobalt if we multiply with the price for cobalt, how much is the turnover in that industry? Well, it's 6.5 billion US dollars. So it's quite a tiny industry. If you compare that, for instance, for iron ore, that's almost a $500 billion industry. And the crude steel industry is a 1.16 trillion US dollar industry. So cobalt industry is tiny. It's nothing. And that's one of the reasons it's easier to scale. It's much easier to scale a tiny industry that only occupies a little bit of resources associated with it than it is to scale a massive industries such as iron and making crude steel. What else can I say? Well, of course, the problem with cobalt is that still 76% of the supply is coming from countries that are unreliable. So therefore, we really need to get going with the deep sea mining to ultimately solve this supply chain risks for cobalt. But one thing we should notice also is that battery electric vehicles, they can be fully recycled. Uh, so eventually much less mining is needed for cobalt. And why do we expect that all batteries from battery electric vehicles will be fully recycled? Well, because batteries that are used will be the perfect mining ore. And we can see that down here in this table I made that lists the value of different sources of mining ore. Basically, I have listed nickel, lithium, cobalt, copper, manganese, and iron. And then I have the prices here for these metals. And then we have a typical Tesla battery cell. How much does it contain of these things? Well, it contains 20% nickel, 2.7% lithium, and 2% cobalt, and 8% copper. And if we go down and see what's the typical surface mine ore for that, well, for nickel, it's 1.2%, so much, much less than the 20% in a used battery. And also for lithium, it's less lithium ore is 0.7%, so much more lithium in a lithium battery. And here we can see 2% cobalt in a battery versus 0.2% in a typical ore for land-based cobalt ore. The more economic just to extract the cobalt from a used battery, as there's 10 times more cobalt in that per ton. And the same here for copper, it's even more. 8% copper in the battery, but only 0.6% in the ore that we mine on the surface. 
And here I had the percentage of metals that are inside these deep sea noodles. This is deep sea cobalt noodles. And as we can see, they have, just to focus on the cobalt, they have 0.7% cobalt in them and still batteries are higher than that and also deep sea manganese noodles they have 0.2 percent cobalt in them that's the same as uh, mining ore for cobalt we can find on the surface but these deep sea manganese noodles are actually the most economic to mine and we can see that if we add up all the value f from what's in these noodles and i've done that here what is the us dollar value of the metals that are inside the ore here for one ton of ore well in a tesla battery cell if we have one ton of used tesla battery cells there's actually 10,500 us dollars worth of raw materials left in that battery you don't throw that out you definitely want to recycle it and i should also say that one ton of used battery cells is enough to make three tesla model y's so you can see here there's about 3400 us dollars worth of raw materials in a used tesla battery for one model y but what about one ton of the other ore here if it's a typical ore here i have calculated it it's 3183 dollars i've marked it in red because it's not the all typical ore we mine here is different kinds of ore so we have one ore for mining nickel another ore for mining lithium another for co cobalt and so forth but here in the battery the metals are all present in the same ton here how many metals do we have for typical ore we have nickel one two three four five six we actually have six tons of different kinds of ore here that will give us this three thousand two hundred dollars worth of metals same with deep sea cobalt noodles it's the same ton of cobalt noodles that we can mine and there are 1480 us dollars worth of metal in in one ton of cobalt noodles and manganese noodles is more valuable to mine because there's 1811 dollars worth of uh, minerals in, in that and I showed you the table from the previous slide. There are actually many more metals that can be mined from these noodles, and I haven't included the money from that. I'd say I had the most valuable stuff included here, so it won't rise much further than this than these values we can see here, but it will rise if we extract all the other things that we can mine from these uh, deep sea noodles. And what else can we see here from this table? I have calculated it individually. Where is the money coming from? So if we look at a used Tesla battery, well, it has $5,000 worth of nickel in it. It has $4,000 worth of lithium, $700 worth of cobalt, another $700 worth of copper, $0 worth of manganese and iron. That's not true. There's a little bit of iron in the enclosures, battery cell enclosures and so forth, but I didn't include it. It will be tiny amounts of money because iron is not very costly. As you can see, it only costs 60 cents per kilo. And what about typical ore here? Yeah, I also got all the values for that. But I think the more interesting thing is, is these noodles, deep sea noodles. Um, where is the value here? Unfortunately, it's mostly in manganese. As you can see, uh, for deep sea cobalt noodles, out of the 1,000... 480 US dollar of value in a ton of these noodles. 1,040 US dollars is from manganese at the current price. And down here with, with, with the other kind of noodle we can mine from deep sea is manganese noodles. That has even more manganese in it, of course, as the name implies. It's 1,277 dollars. That's from manganese. And then it has also value from copper, 99 dollars, and cobalt, 68 dollars. Nickel, $130. But of course, if we start to mine these uh, noodles, uh, something will happen to the prices. But I think that's enough for this slide. So let's move on here to the next slide. And in this slide, I made a thought experiment. What would happen if we mined 309 million tons of manganese noodles per year? And here we should note that both cobalt ore from land and also these manganese noodles, they both contain 0.2% cobalt. So those 309 million tons, they contain 618,000 tons of cobalt or enough for making 100 million battery electric vehicles. That was basically the same calculation as we saw uh, before, where we had this table here and where we had calculated this and it was the same. But now I have also included, for this slide here, I have included a specific table that calculates all the content of mining 309 million tons of manganese noodles. And we can see here, 
for cobalt, it's the same because the ore is the same. 0.2% cobalt in the ore gives you 618,000 tons of pure cobalt. And since we need 6.2 kilo for each battery electric vehicle, we can make 100 million battery electric vehicles by dividing this number into this number. And we can do the same calculation for the other metals that are present in this manganese noodles. So manganese, for instance, that's 27% ore quality here for manganese. That would give us, if we mined all of it from the ore and from those 309 million tons, then we'll get eight 83 and a half million tons of that. Since we only need 10 kilo for each vehicle, we could actually make 8.3 billion battery electric vehicles if we just use that manganese for making battery electric vehicles. But battery electric vehicles don't really use a lot of manganese. Today's manganese production, we have it up here, it's 20 million tons and pretty much all of it is going into making crude steel because about 1% of the crude steel is manganese. Crude steel is an alloy and, and it has 1% manganese in it and that's about those 20 million tons that are used there for making 2,000 million tons of crude steel. What else do we have? The most important uh, metal, I think, would be nickel. There is 1.3% nickel in uh, these manganese noodles that would get us 4 million tons of nickel which is really needed i made another video about nickel and nickel is something we would like to get more of Elon Musk has said, please mine more nickel to the miners for reasons that are sound. And mining this deep sea manganese noodle would be a way to get a lot of nickel made. 4 million tons, that would be enough for 65 million battery electric vehicles with a typical Tesla nickel rich battery in it. So a lot of nickel. We would also get a significant amount of copper. There's 1.1% copper in these manganese noodles, so we would get 3.4 million tons of copper. That would be enough to make 37 million battery electric vehicles, so quite a lot. And there's also iron, there's 6% of that in it, but it's not so valuable, but we use a lot of that for all kind of things and it would be enough to make 20 million battery electric vehicles. But that's not so critical uh, because we have a lot of that of iron ore on land and it's also a better quality than this, these 6%. Uh, iron ore on land is 50%. So we would not mine these manganese noodles for iron. We'd mine it for cobalt, manganese, nickel and copper. That's where the big value is in it. But also I calculated how much is the value actually of this and, and we can see it in this table here. And here I have calculated both for current prices. So the current US dollar per kilo price of cobalt here, manganese, nickel, copper and, and iron, I've all listed it here. And then I multiply with the amount that we could extract from this ore and then value mined, I've calculated that as in billion dollars. So we could extract 21 billion dollars of cobalt from 309 million tons of manganese noodles and we could extract almost 400 billion dollars worth of manganese and also for nickel it would be 102 billion dollars and 30 billion dollars for copper and 11 billion dollars for iron and the value of all that sums up to 560 billion us dollars so it would be quite a big industry from mining these 309 million tons of manganese noodles but what i expect would happen if we mine that manganese noodle is that the prices they won't stay the same in particular for manganese which is actually the most valuable part of it if we mine that much ore that contain all that manganese then the price of manganese should be expected to drop sharply so just as the thought experiment i don't know exactly what would happen with prices but here i have made a scenario where the price of manganese dropped to only 20 percent of what it is today so it drops from 4.7 us dollar per kilo to barely a dollar per kilo but i also expect that in the future where we need to make a lot more battery electric vehicles and also wind power and solar power and all kind of other things that require more materials of stuff we don't use so much of today well that could perhaps double the price for cobalt and nickel and copper so if these prices are doubled for cobalt nickel and copper and it's and the price of manganese is cut to one-fifth of what it is today what would be the future value in of this industry then i calculated that in this 
colon here and summed it up, then it would be almost 400 billion US dollars. So still a very sizable industry. And hopefully that would be enough to both get the manganese noodle up from the seabed, but also to extract these metals from uh, the manganese noodle, because that will probably be the most costly thing, the extraction. But I'm not an expert on this, so I don't know what exactly costs what in which process. And for sure, we don't know how much it costs to get these noodles up, because we haven't made these machines yet. Okay, so I gave it a little more thought about what would happen to uh, the price of manganese if we started to mine these uh, manganese noodles. And I discovered something, and that is that manganese ore, we mine 66 million tons of that. And we get a lot of manganese out of it because the ore percent at land is 30%. And we are selling it for uh, 95 billion US dollars, as, as we can see in this uh, table. So it's a big industry. But how much does it actually cost to mine 66 million tons of ore? Well, we have an estimate for that, and that's coal. Coal in the US costs like 50 US dollar per ton to mine, and then another 50 dollars to transport it a long way. So about 100 dollars. Currently, it's selling coal in the global market for $200 per ton, as we can see here. But that's not normal. That's because of this uh, Ukraine-Russian war and supply constraints. The normal long-term price is $100 US dollar per ton in the international market, and that, that includes transport. So mining ore or coal from an open pit mine, and also look that up, that manganese is indeed mined from open pit mines from basically a big hole on the surface of the earth that you have a lot of excavators uh, dig the ore up from. That's how you do it with coal and that's also how you do it with manganese ore. So if we multiply those 67 million tons of ore with $100 for digging it up and transporting it to the refinery, well that's only 7 billion US dollar uh, in value, but the industry here can sell the final product for 95 billion US dollar. So it just shows that there's not a whole lot of value in getting manganese noodles up from the deep sea. The most of the value in this value chain here is really about refining. Digging it up and transporting the ore to the site is not a very costly thing. And that has me think that that might be the reason why nobody has started this deep sea mining, because it's hard to compete with surface land mining of ore, because it's so dirt cheap to uh, just dig stuff up and transport it. We have become really effective at that, at about 100 US dollar per ton. So therefore, the future of deep sea mining, I only think it will be initiated if we really see some big price increases for cobalt, nickel and copper. And manganese, well, I don't think it matters much what will happen to that price because manganese noodles will not be mined for the value of that manganese because that man manganese ore is dirt cheap already and plentiful on the surface. So that's not going to be worth a lot. But if you can get the cobalt and copper and nickel out of it, that's what will have some value in the future. And you probably need to see much higher prices for these products before we see deep sea mining activity to start happening here. That's something I, I thought I should mention to be a little realistic about the future prospects for deep sea mining. It's not super great, not at the current prices. And But if anybody should do this and uh, develop the technology for digging noodles out from the seabeds, which companies should do that? Well, it will probably be Exxon or British Petroleum because they already have the capital and they also have the engineers that are specialized at working with equipment offshore and also underwater equipment. So I think if somebody can do this and make this industry a profitable industry and to dig this all up, it will be these two companies. But I think that will pretty much uh, do it for this slide. And then we only have a slide with some sources left. As I said, you can download the presentation and you can also download the Excel spreadsheet that contain all the links for all the numbers I have calculated and all the data I have in these uh, tables. So if you found this video interesting, consider giving it a thumbs up and also subscribe to my channel. I'll have much more interesting stuff coming on. And thank you very much for watching my video. I wish you a healthy and fulfilling life in freedom and democracy.